So, hello everybody, and welcome to the Real Time Linux Mini Summit. This is our first year virtual, but we invite everybody to participate as if we were all together in the same place. And uh, this year, we try to uh, put more uh, introductory uh, uh, topics, try to invite more people to participate, to join on our community and to make connections, right? And uh, our agenda this year starts with Steven with his fabulous presentation, introducing the real-time Linux, explaining who needs it and who also doesn't need it, right? Then we'll have uh, John Kaser presenting the real-time test suite and RT Ball, which is the tool that we as developers use it every day. And he explain to us about the past and the future. We will see a very nice use case of the RAM 30 on the determinist networking to control a robot arm uh, by Henrik. And uh, we will finish it with the with a panel discussing what are the plans of uh, real-time Linux with Thomas Glexner and Kate Stewart. And uh, I invite everybody to participate, making questions in the chat, and we will try to address uh, during the presentation or at the end of each presentation. So with that, I pass the word to Steven, who will start his presentation now. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen. Let's see. <clears throat> can everyone see it? Okay. So. Let me get started. Um, hi, I'm Steve Rosted. I'm open source engineer at VMware. I'm one of the original developers of the real-time patch, and I currently lead the effort in maintaining the RT stable trees. So I only have a half hour, so let me get right to it. So first, this is an introdu introductory kind of presentation I'm having here. So I'm going to ask, what is real-time? Um, it's kind of like saying, what is your favorite color? Blue. No, red. Anyway, um, the term I feel is ambiguous, uh, to say the least. So if we were to go search on the internet and look up the definition of real time, uh, let's start off with urbandictionary.com. You can find some really interesting definitions here, but um, I just searched real time and there I found uh, what real time is, is instantaneous, taking place at once as other things are also in progress. When I surveyed the situation in real time, there were only four people who met the qualifications. Doesn't really tell you much. Let's try uh, another place. Let's go look at um, what is .com. And here it says, real time is a level of computer responsiveness that a user senses as sufficiently immediate or that enables the computer to keep up with some external process. For example, to present visualizations of the weather as it constantly changes. Real time is an adjective pertaining to computers or processes that operate in real time. Real time describes a human rather than a machine sense of time. Still doesn't really answer my question. So let's try Google. Uh, and here I find it says the actual time during which a process or events occurs. Along with much of the country, he watches events unfold in real time on his TV. Hey, it has something about computing too, which comes to relating to a system in which input data is processed within milliseconds, use milliseconds, so that it is available virtually immediately as feedback. For example, in a missile guidance or airline booking system. Well, <laughs> missile guidance in milliseconds, okay. Uh, real time singling pro single processing. But for us, for this talk, for what preempt RT, we're going to say, Real time is basically doing what you expect to be doing in the amount of time you expect it to be done. What does that mean? Determinism. I've always said that I hate the term real time operating system because of this ambiguity or whatever you call it, ambiguous term. And I like to think it should have been called a deterministic operating system, DOS. Okay, this joke never gets old, at least it doesn't get old for me or some of us old fogies. But actually, uh, DOS was actually a very good real-time system. It would always do what you expect it to do. It would crash reliably. So what does real-time operating system give us? Faster. 
I've always had a lot of people come to me and say, hey, I can't wait to run the real-time operating system or the preempt RT patch and see how fast my system is running. Is it faster? No, they're usually up for a surprise. In fact, sometimes it will be slower. But I don't like to advertise that real time is slower. It's not quite. So, but real time does not mean fast. It means real. It means actual time. So a lot of times people think real time is fast. I don't know why. It's just because it's real doesn't mean it's fast. But what does it give us? Again, determinism. But being a de deterministic, what does that give us? Repeatability, reliable results, a known worst case scenario. You know what your worst scenarios will be. You could actually calculate it in theory. Uh, when there's something that you have to get done within a deadline, and if you don't get done within that time, the system fails, period. You have to start over, crashes, whatever, uh, good or bad. You can't have any case where, you know, hey, if this race condition happens, we're going to have this outlier that's going to fail or break our deadline. In that case, the system is, a fail, is failed and it's not a real time system. So you also have known reaction times. And going back to about saying real time is slow. I don't like to say that a real time operating system is slow. I like to say it's the fastest worst case scenario operating system, which means that compared to non real time systems, a real time system will be faster when everything goes wrong than any other system. So if you have another system, you know, you can say, hey, this is fast 99.99% of the time. Well, that 0.001% of the time, it could be really, really slow and fail your system because of it. Here's another little pet peeve of mine. And a lot of times when we first started developing Pramps RT, a lot of people said, Linux can never be hard real time. And the reason why is because in the old days, hard real time, there was no other operating system. The only time you had a real hard real time operating system, you had to create it from scratch. So a lot of money had to be invested in doing such a, such a uh, uh, job. So what they say back then is mathematically provable. You could prove that it, can, it will never have an outlier. Um, so because to do this operation is sort of NP complete, the bigger the code gets, it becomes almost impossible to prove its correctness. Another thing that hard real time gives you is that bounded latency. There's, you, there's gonna be latency, but you could know what that latency is and you could mathematically calculate that this is the worst latency that you have to deal with. On the other hand, what does soft real time give us? You know, you heard the term soft real time. Well, it allows for outliers. Um, as long as the average is predictable. Um, one thing that soft real time is defined as is that you can prioritize tasks. You can have this task, this process be a higher priority than this other process. And majority of the time, this process will act deterministic, but it might have outliers. Uh, it's still reliable, um, but there's, it could have a latency, that unbounded latency that you don't know about. So let's go back to some real time examples. Engine control systems. When I first started working in the fields, I was on. I worked for um, uh, actually it was General Motors, something like that, and I did real time. We worked on the C17 engine control system, and that was a hard real time system. It wasn't Linux, obviously, but it was one of these things. They spent a lot of money in uh, developing a system that was reliable, um, and it made all its deadlines. and It took basically ten years before it could be deployed because of all the testing, rigorous testing it had to go to, it was really controlled. So a lot of people think of that's a hard real time system. And that's, that's the mind I'm trying to get people out of because there's other use cases, robotics. Robotics, um, like an assembly line, if you have an assembly line that has robotics that are doing machine work uh, in, in industry and such, uh, it needs to be real time because it's like I said, when the assembly line's moving, that's real time. When a product comes by that the robotics has to work on, it can't be late. It can't let the product go by and then go, the arm comes down. That's a miss failed in the system. So that's dealing with real time controls. And in that case, you need a hard real time system. But believe it or not, music comes in this case as well. Uh, and it kind of was surprising for me, but actually music requires real time, hard real time. 
I'll get back to that. Some soft real-time examples. Uh, video, when you're doing, watching a video, if you're watching a lot of time uh, with Netflix and everything, there's a lot of video streaming going on. And that's a real-time system as well, but it's soft real-time. It's It could miss an outlier. If you miss a few things, it's more or less, you could have outliers and it's kind of a spectrum. The, the less outliers you have, you don't even notice it. When it gets to be more outliers, then it gets annoying. You have free, frames freeze. That's a soft real-time system. Telecommunications, same thing. If you're talking on the phone and you have a glitch or if you have bad communications or this network, this, that's um, also soft real-time. Well, if you're talking about sound in a telecommunication system, well, what about music? Why is that hard real time and not the telecommunications? Well, when we first started working on the pre preempt RT patch, I was surprised that musicians were actually one of our first testers. I got an email once, you know, a bug report from this guy, and I sent him a patch and said, can you try this to fix it? And the guy said, well, no, it doesn't write, quite work. And since it was, I looked at it, oh, I made a mistake. Could you do this trivial change? The guy's like, whoa, 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 I, I don't know how to change code. I'm like, wait, you could apply a patch, but you don't know how to change code? What do you mean? He's like, I'm not a computer developer. And I was shocked. I said, what do you mean you're not a computer developer? Why are you using preempt RT? He says, I'm a musician. I'm a guitarist. And I'm like, really? He says, yeah, I just know how to apply patches. That's all I know how to do. I don't know how to touch the code. And what he told me, because I, I started talking to him back and forth, and he said that what happens is when he does a recording, the preempt RT kernel was the only system that he could afford. Like I said, hard real-time systems you have to create from scratch. But Linux provided with the preempt RT patch, we provided a hard real-time system that he said that when he did his recording, if there was an outlier, it would come in as a scratch. For those that don't know what scratches are, like from a vinyl record, um, static. It'll be like a static in the recording. Now, if you're doing music and beautiful thing, any little static or glitch like that kills the song. You've got to start from scratch again. If you're doing a recording and you get a scratch, you stop. That's a system failure. That's why music requires hard real time. Because in the, it comes down to if there's an outlier, if there's something that fails, is it going to destroy or fail the system? And that goes underneath with music. This conference is soft real time. As we probably found out throughout the week, uh, there's a lot of times things things glitched up. Yeah, it's annoying, but it doesn't fail the systems. You can continue. Uh, there's workarounds. That's soft real time, basically, for you. Real workarounds. Because uh, you, you allowed a few missed deadlines as long as it doesn't crash. And FYI, Linux without the real time patch is a soft real time system. It allows for you to prioritize various aspects of. Um, the kernel or the tasks to go in. And in fact, it's become quite a very high quality soft real-time system because of the work of the preempt RT patch. Uh, the preempt RT patch has been going into Linux for the last decade or so. So there's half, there's so many features that the real-time uh, vanilla Linux got that came directly from the real-time patch uh, that vanilla Linux works so well that I've talked to people who use recordings that they said vanilla Linux most of the time works good enough. They don't have to even use the preempt RT patch because vanilla Linux is close to being a real time system that they don't have those latencies of uh, scratches and such in their systems. But what about the real time patch? What is it? If it's hard real time it has to be um, mathematically provable and whatever, but let me say, is it soft real time OS? I'm like, we don't allow outliers. The real time patch does not allow any outliers um, and we don't have unbounded latency. So it, not a soft real-time system. But is it a hard real-time system? And the thing is, it's too big to be mathematically provable. And that's why I said, it, because I, MP complete, you can't quite actually prove it to be correct. But what is it then? I like to tell people it's hard real-time designed. Like I said, it's too big to be mathematically provable. Although some people are trying to do so. Right, Daniel? Um, all design decisions are to make it hard real time. So every design that we do inside the kernel, we look at, it says, can this little section of code that we're working on, does it have a worst case scenario that we could define? We could calculate and say, this could take so long and we could calculate a worst case scenario. Now remember, some people say hard real time means that I need to have you know, uh, reaction times within one microsecond. And I, first of all, Intel architecture will not give you that. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. The thing is though, hard real time just means, can it make a, can you define the worst case scenario? 
Now, yes, there's going to be different operating systems. You, you have to make it really, really small and run on special hardware if you are having microsecond uh, reaction times that you need. But if you, a lot of cases, you only need millisecond um, action times. Heck, that one definition said milliseconds. And something like Linux with the preemptor T patch, milliseconds is like a lifetime. I mean, it, it takes, that's forever. We don't have any issues with making millisecond uh, reaction times. It, we're, we're usually looking at less than 100 microseconds. So, yes. Anything that breaks this in our design is considered a bug. So, again, hard real time sometimes comes down to quality. When people say hard real time, it's the quality of the code, not really the code itself or making it real time. It has nothing to do with real time. It's more about quality. So, if everything works, if there was no bugs in Linux and we wish for that. If there's no bugs in Linux and we had the design decision, we would be we would easily be defined hard real time if we could mathematically prove it. <clears throat> Another thing is there are exceptions. There are some places in the code that we know that can cause a unbounded latency or or missed outlier, but they're well defined. We could say that avoid doing this and your system will run perfectly fine. And if you document it, again, hard real time is all about the system itself. You, when you, I've talked before in other presentations saying that when you do need real time, it's from bottom up. You need everything to be real time. So when you design your system and you know that this operating system that you're using has paths that can make it so that it's not, that you might miss your deadline, you can avoid those paths if they're well-defined, well-documented. And there are some cases, I mean, for, there are some places in the file system that you could cause you to have missed latencies. This file system is writing to disk and such like that. And um, also, if you're doing some tracing or debugging operations, I could kick off some trace features that are known to break if you, comp you could compile them out too. So if you're worried about them, just compile them out. What about latency? Um, when you look up the definition of latency in Wikipedia, you say, it says, um, latency from a general point of view is the time delay between the cause and the effect of some physical change in the system being observed. Actually, that's not really a bad definition. I like to call it latency is simply the time between when an event is expected to happen and when it actually does happen. Think about when you're sitting in the traffic and you're looking at the traffic light and the light turns green and you, the time between the light turning green and the car, car in front of you moving forward so you can move forward, that's a latency. Types of latency for what we're worried about. Uh, the first one is interrupt latency. And I like to say that there's two types of interrupt latencies. Now interrupts, as you should, everyone should know, but if you don't, is basically what happens when a network packet comes into your network interface card or when you type on your keyboard. Uh, the device needs to tell the CPU there's something that it needs to work on because the device just says it receives a networking packet. Now it tells the CPU, go process this networking packet. So it sends an interrupt to the CPU and the CPU has to stop what it's doing to and jump to some memory location where the interrupt handler exists and will execute that code to process the networking packet. But that could take a long time as well. And well, your process, if you have a high priority process running and say on that same machine that you're running your you know, robotics system, you have your child doing uh, playing video games using the same machine and it's the video or it's over the network and it's just bombarding the system and sending a bunch of packets. Every time a pa uh, interrupt comes in, it stops your high priority process from moving and you'll miss your deadlines. And if you have that donut hole puncher, it's going to make off-centered donut holes. So you don't want to do that. So I call the time when, so if you get a lot of interrupts coming in, I the time interrupted by the interrupt is the latency. How long that your system is, has to wait for something else to run. But on the other side, if your system requires a um, stimulus from a device, and like if you want to have, you have a sensor or a networking packet that you want to uh, respond to real quick, well, the CPU can turn off interrupts. And this is when interrupts are disabled. So the CPU could go on doing whatever it wants but it disables the interrupts. So all these devices have to wait for that CPU to say, hey, okay, I'll listen to you again. And in that time frame, that's another type of latency uh, that could happen. I call it interrupt disabled latency. 
And then, of course, there's shared resources between uh, lower priority tasks and higher priority tasks. If they're share, sharing the same resource, you have to usually have locking between it or to, to protect it. And when a high priority process has to wait on a low priority process to get out of that critical section so it can get in there, there's that latency as well. So talking about the interrupt handlers, um, when a high priority process is running and it, it gets preempted uh, or interrupted by the interrupt that comes in, and it has to wait for that handler to completely finish before you go in. So this whole time frame happens to be um, the interrupt latency for that interrupt. So how does preempt RT solve this situation? Because hard real, uh, interrupts is a hardware feature. There's not, we can't change the design of the hardware and how to handle this. So we still need to take the interrupt, but we can make that interruption much smaller and calculate it. So this is what it looks like in preempt RT. So instead of actually doing a true handler handling the interrupt, it will just acknowledge to the kernel saying, hey, this interrupt came in, deal with it. And the kernel could go back to running its high priority process. And it has a dedicated interrupt thread that will actually handle that interrupt. And because it's a thread, that means that it gives users access to modify the thread's priority. You can make a high priority process or thread so because of your high priority uh, task requires a device to access. You can make that device's interrupt handler's high priority so it, it could run over everything else. Or if you have a bunch of things going on that you don't care about, uh, it can make those interrupt handlers lower priority and let your higher priority process run without being interrupted. I mean, it interrupts once for the interrupt comes in, but then the interrupt is disabled until the thread could run. So you won't get an interrupt again, which means that you could calculate what that worst case scenario is. And if you're running the preempt RT patch and you do a PS grep IRQ, you'll see that there's a list of uh, interrupt threads that you have control of. So latency always happens. Nothing is instantaneous. No matter how good an operating system is, there's always going to be a case where a response comes in, it's going to take time before you could reply to that uh, response. Priority inversion. This is when something that should be running has to wait for, for something that shouldn't be running. Um, if a high priority process wants to run or it's, it needs to run and there's a lower priority process that has to wait for it, that's called priority inversion. This too always happens. Unless you could dedicate a system that doesn't have any shared resources whatsoever and you just have a single thread running without ever being interrupted. And there are cases that there are designs that they do that where you won't have a priority version. But once you have anything that uh, needs to interact with each other, there's always going to be a cases where something, if a shared resource is being involved, something has to, a lower priority process will wait for the higher priority process to get in. What we care about is bounded priority inversion. This means that you know how long that higher priority process will wait, always. And you can calculate it in theory, that you can always say, I could actually calculate what the worst case scenario would be. And as long as it's within my deadlines, I'm fine. What we don't want is unbounded priority inversion, which means that you, don't, you can't calculate it. There's no way to know what this is. And this is the priority inversion that we have to watch out for. And this is my favorite slides. I've shown this in every single RT talk I've ever given. I always have to throw these slides in just to show them anyway. But uh, for those that have seen my talks before, you know what I'm going to talk about. Uh, yes, there is a Mars rover or something like that back uh, decades ago, wherever that was going up to Mars and it hit this priority in inversion si situation pretty much exactly. And they I rebooted and they actually had to disable one of the threads to keep this from happening again. But the way priority inversion works is, you, let's say you have three processes. Process A, which is the highest priority process, process B, medium priority, and C, the lowest priority process, doing some just logging or whatever. And process C is going to share some resource with process A, so there's, there's some mutex around it. So when process C is executing, it grabs the lock, goes into this critical section, and A wakes up, preempting C. So A runs, now A wants to go into that same critical section that C is in, so it grabs the lock that C has, but because it has the lock, it's got to wait, so it gets blocked and goes back down and C runs. Well, in the meantime, before it could release that lock, B wakes up, which is higher priority, higher priority than C, and now it goes runs. Well, by blocking C, it also blocks A, which is of a higher priority process in itself. And this is where you have unbounded priority inversion. Let's say that, the process B has to, um, let's say process B only stops when A stops it. That means it will never stop and just goes on and A is dead. Of course, 
well, the way that the preemptor T solves this is what we call priority inheritance. And how this works is the same situation happens, sees runs, goes once again into the critical section, grabs a lock, A wakes up once again to the same critical section, grabs a lock, block. But well, here's the difference. When A blocks on the lock that C has, C will then inherit the priority of that lock or of the process that's waiting on that lock. So it inherits A's priority. Now C, while it's running, holding a lock that A is blocked on, it will be running at the priority of A. So now when B wakes up, since B is lower priority than A and C is currently running at the priority of A, it can't wake up. And C gets to finish its process. And when it releases the lock, it now will lose its priority, but now A can grab that um, the resource and it will wake up and run and still keep B from running, but it could finish and then tells B, okay, you're ready to go. So this is how we handle that priority and uh, inheritance. Um, and before I finish the talk here, I said in the beginning that it's more than just a kernel. And I know Thomas Gleichner says this too, that you can, oh, no matter how good the operating system is, if it's running on hardware that's not good for you, or it's not reliable, not deterministic, your system will not be reliable and it will not be deterministic. Uh, it's funny because a lot of people care about real fast. And when you care about real fast, you don't need real time. Uh, if you ideally you want both, but it's a balancing thing you have to do. You either you have to maybe have to give up some uh, speed to make sure that you're deterministic if that's what you need. And like memory cache, memory cache inside the kernel is or inside your computer is something that makes the system run fast because the CPU runs faster than the memory bus. So it's always pulling stuff in. And every so often, if you have a like you need to access a memory that's not in your cache, you have to uh, basically stall to pull in the memory. And that's unreliable. And that, that's it makes things fast, but it makes it so it's not deterministic. We can't predict when this is always going to happen, or it's very, very difficult to predict it always. And what they could do is you could turn off memory cache, but your system will now run so slow that maybe you won't be able to make your deadlines. And you know that the actual worst case scenario is somewhere between memory off and cache completely on. So it's, it makes things more difficult. And same thing if TLB misses, uh, when a page, uh, when you pull in your page and you have to access memory that's not in the, in the TLB and then the system has to go and walk the page tables again, that causes a, uh, um, a non-deterministic latency. Although you kind of calculate it, but it can happen. It's very hard to get these things right. Uh, system management interrupts is really the, uh, you know, the Achilles heel to all real-time systems. And if you have a system that runs, like a system management interrupt is when the bias is doing something. For example, a lot of laptops will have thermal controls that's controlled by the bias because uh, it doesn't trust the operating system and for good reason, because uh, the bias or the vendor knows exactly how the thermal controls work on your system to make sure that your uh, laptop doesn't burn up. So it will kick off uh, code within the bias, and it, that's called the SMI, which stops the kernel from running to execute this special code in system management mode that the kernel has no control over. So no matter how good your kernel is, it can't stop these SMIs. Um, so the OS, again, can only be as deterministic as the hardware is running on. And with that, I hope you enjoyed the show, and I, I'm going to stop sharing so I could see the rest of the screens. So I don't know what's going on. So we have two minutes for questions, and the questions are being handled by a chat. Yeah, I think there's one question in the chat already um, from Pavel saying, is there, uh, is there a list of the unbounded operations in the RT kernel somewhere? Uh, not yet. <laughs> I think we're looking at that. I think we're trying to, I, I believe some of the issues was, I believe comes with the real, uh, the read write lock that we have to look at because I, I'm sure Thomas might be able to answer this too. Um, the, re, the reader writer locks is something that's of a uh, issue because you have a situation of multiple processes that could be, um, that could own a lock. Uh, so if you have a bunch of readers running and a writer comes in, prior, prior inheritance becomes almost exponentially more complex. Believe me, I've tried to do this a few times and it <laughs> all in failure. So, um, I mean, it works, but it gets buggy. 
So basically, ideally, if we try to avoid paths that have the reader write locks, which I believe is in the file system and such. So uh, you really have to analyze the system. Uh, no matter what you have, if you're using a driver, we haven't analyzed every single driver. A driver might be doing this as well. So there isn't quite a list, but we once we once we start pushing this, and if, if you're going to do something, this is why you hire people like Thomas Kleckner to go and analyze your system and see what you're doing to make sure that you don't how to avoid these paths. So it may not be well documented right now, but we it's it's not hard to find out these areas. I guess that's the best. I think we're at time. So um, maybe if people have more questions for Steve, if they want to put them in the chat, we'll circle back or he can answer in the chat too. Oops, we got one more. That's a general rule of thumb for ranges of latency. That's, uh, <laughs> uh, it really comes down to hardware. Uh, I think we said, I, I when I run on my machines, I just have a typical, I guess, I-7 that I run on and I do tests on this and I can easily get below 150 or 100 uh, microseconds on almost every test stress I do. But in theory, the worst case scenario, if I believe uh, Daniel's done a lot of work in his research, he has some papers that read about this, that um, I believe it's more like 100, in actuality, Daniel, correct me if I'm wrong, like 150 um, microseconds, like on a normal like Intel processor and such. Yes, yes, that's a very safe value. Yeah, but yeah, if you have a, a, a real time, it's hard. Uh, if you're doing a slow, like 32 bit, one gigahertz arm, you know, that's probably a hundred microseconds. I'm sure it's probably good. Cause also I bet you those arm systems are not as um, non-deterministic as Intel is. Okay. So our time is a little bit short in this version of the, the meeting. So Stephen can continue answering the questions via chat. And uh, we'll have now the talk by John Kaser about the RT tools. So John Kaser, it's our time. Okay, I'll start by unmuting. That's always a good idea. Share screen here. All right, can you see my screen there? Yes. Um, okay, I'm John Kaser. I work for Red Hat. Um, I'm on the real-time kernel team, but I mostly focus on a variety of tools for measuring the performance of the real-time kernel. Um, and of course, those same tools that you can use to test, uh, first of all, whether the real-time kernel is working correctly as expected, and then um, seeing if the latencies are within a uh, correct kind of measurement. Um, these same kind of tools are also useful for application developers um, because as you know, with um, real time, we're, we give you enough rope to hang yourself. Um, so you can screw up in ways that you can't screw up uh, with normal Linux operating system. So if you're writing bad code, which is um, taking over uh, the machine in ways you don't want it to, then these kind of um, measurement applications will also uh, let you know where your code uh, needs to be fixed. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about RT tests and RT eval. Um, I'll give you a quick overview of everything, um, but I only have 15 minutes, um, but part of what I really wanted was input from the RT community at large. So I don't care if that's in the form of uh, emails after or, or chatting and stuff, but I'd really like to hear, you know, everything, if everything's working fine and, you know, what people would like to see uh, from these tools in the future, or maybe everyone's just happy, works well enough. <laughs> so what is RT tests? Well, it's a suite of tools, but it started off with a cyclic test. And cyclic test to this day is, as far as I can see, it's the main tool by which uh, the kernel developers are testing the, the latency of the, the real-time kernel. Um, so Thomas wrote it and uh, Clark started uh, adding some stuff, uh, Clark Williams started adding some tools to it. And uh, I think Thomas uh, put the, gave the maintenance of it over to him. And then 
Clark had me fix a few threading problems in various tests. And uh, after that, um, I sort of got addicted to working on it and I've sort of taken over the maintainership now. Um, it's been around for a really long time. Um, geez, I don't even wanna say how many years. Uh, Thomas could tell more accurately. Uh, I bet it's 13 anyways, if not 15. Um, so after Cyclic Test was written, um, Thomas and Karsten Emda, um, they, using the model of Cyclic Test, they wrote a whole bunch of uh, tests and most of them aren't used as to the same degree that Cyclic Test is, but they have the same kind of general model for testing. And some of them are quite interesting and um, they don't always get the attention they deserve. So. I have um, a list here, roughly in the order uh, that I think things were developed. Um, just to remind people they're there, have a look. Um, so the PMQ test is measuring the latency of um, interprocess communications with POSIX messages. And then PT SEMA test does the same thing only with mutexes. Um, so I've done my best uh, over the years to, to maintain these uh, extra um, tools in there, but they don't get the same attention that Cyclic Test does. Um, but I, yeah, that's something that could still be improved in the future. Just by sharing more code, that would be a good way, you know, when things are fixed, uh, that it's fixed everywhere. Um, there's the signal test that measures a round trip between a signal the single weight test, which um, is measuring the latency of sending and receiving a signal. Um, the uh, system five uh, semaphore test, um, which is measuring the latency of system five semaphores. Okay, so those tests that I were that I mentioned briefly before, they're all sort of modeled on cyclic tests. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Clark had written this thing called uh, PI stress, um, which <clears throat> would purposely create priority inversions. And um, if the real-time kernel wasn't working properly, you could potentially have um, a deadlock. Um, so this uh, would test also the correctness of the kernel. Um, and then when Clark uh, started maintaining the uh, RT test tools, then he added this and um, then I was talking to Thomas once and um, he was telling me about, you can actually uh, use, um, whoops, um, how do I go back there? Uh, previous. <clears throat> you can have a uh, priority inheritance without using POSIX threads. And uh, he told me how to do that. So I wrote a little test that uh, demonstrated that. And that's the PIP stress. It was sort of modeled after PI stress, but um, without using POSIX threads. Um, something else that we have in there, um, which is still important to this day, is the hardware latency detector. Um, it originally used a kernel module um, by uh, John Masters and, um, and Clark wrote the Python code. Um, and the idea was to measure any kind of latencies that were outside the control of the kernel um, such as uh, system management interrupts in firmware. And uh, there's still, this is still one of the reasons why certain hardware is not suitable for uh, real time today. Um, we don't need to use that kernel module anymore. Thank goodness we can use the um, built-in F-Trace um, hardware latency detector and, and connect to that. Um, that's from uh, Steven Rostet. Um, then um, we got a bunch of tests by um, Steve and um, they're also modeled roughly like cyclic tests. Um, and uh, they measured the, uh, the, at the time, the newly added uh, schedule deadline. So there's the cyclic deadline and the deadline test. Um, oh, and he also wrote this, uh, could almost be a separate slide because it's, it's not in the same category, but the RT migrate test, um, which ensures that if you have priority tasks that they're, that if there's an available CPU, it's running on that CPU. <clears throat> um, then came the Q 
uh, latency written by Marcelo, and it simulates um, a network queue and uh, to check for latency violations and packet processing. Okay, something that we've added quite recently um, is something called OSLAT. And what OSLAT came from our uh, real-time plus KVM team. And um, they were using sys jitter and uh, they, they needed something to do a sort of poll model test to de detect OS level interruptions. They liked sys jitter, but they were very unhappy with the output and the way it processed the statistics. So this is the reason if you're wondering why they didn't just um, use sys jitter, this is the reason that they wrote their, their own version. So it's called OSLAT. Um, and it's kind of cool because um, it also supports multi-threading and F-trace interactions. And um, so that's what OSLAT is. <clears throat> so um, quite a while ago, I think it was maybe 2016, <clears throat> I thought it was time to say, you know, we've got a done version of cyclic tests. We'll call it 1.0 and um, um, I'll continue to maintain that version, but like development had slowed down on it quite a bit. So I thought, um, let's um, spin off a so-called unstable branch where people won't be afraid to break the APIs. Um, so that, you know, should allow people to be more creative and they don't have to be so careful. Let's try a bunch of new things. But what happened is I wasn't receiving really any patches for the stable version of cyclic test. So, but I was receiving lots of patches for the so-called unstable branch. And um, it seemed like the different um, uh, Linux distributions were pretty much just using the latest unstable branch as a, as a stable version. So I am kind of considering that 1.0 is long, long ago dead and the unstable branch is just the stable branch. Um, I still have um, a rather confusing way that these branches are named. I apologize for that. I'm going to clean that up. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so one of the first things we did after we um, spun off the um, the unstable version was we removed all the ftrace code and it was quite a bit of code and confusing kind of code. And the reason that we did that and were able to do that is because of uh, Steve Rostat's tool called trace command. And we were able to actually just leave in a few uh, break points in the cyclic test code and but allow the trace command tool to do um, all the actual work for tracing, which was great. It simplified cyclic test quite a bit. Now I know that um, Steve is creating libraries now um, that uh, trace command is using. And um, I'm curious about how this is gonna change the way tools like cyclic tests use ftrace in the future. Um, so we've also you know, removed, there was a huge alphabet of um, options in cyclic tests. We tried to simplify it quite a bit. Um, so, I mean, one thing we did was you don't specify NUMA anymore. It's just detected automatically. Um, so quite a bit of work was done to improve how NUMA works and fix problems with CPU affinity. And this was important for tools like RTEval, which use a uh, cyclic test. <clears throat> um, I recently added a snapshot utility, which just allows if you have like a Imagine you're running cyclic tests for a week and um, you want to get a status report to see uh, if it's worthwhile to keep running it or whether you need to stop it. Um, you can just send it a little signal and get the status and it keeps running. So I hope that's useful to folks. Um, <clears throat> boy, I'm running out of time here. Um, so people see Hackbench and say, what the heck is Hackbench doing in the suite? Well, we have our own version of um, Hackbench um, because we thought, um, how can we uh, screw up um, cyclic tests? Let's, um, let's create some noise in the background and try and uh, mess with what's going on. So, um, all right, it's used by RTVAL, which I'm gonna talk about next briefly. So RTVAL is a program to basically evaluate how 
Um, the real-time kernel is running on various hardware. Um, I know that that's typically um, telcos and they're running large machines with maybe hundreds of CPUs and NUMA machines and so on. It's Python code and it runs, it can run multiple instances of cyclic test on uh, various nodes, um, NUMA nodes, or it can just um, run the threads of cyclic test uh, if it's just one node um, on various CPUs. Um, it does that concurrently while it's uh, running Hackbench and doing kernel builds. So we're just trying to create background noise that could screw things up. Um, so uh, we also use it for our customers to evaluate whether their hardware is suitable for real time and we'll certify whether it is or not. <clears throat> um, this was ported to Python 3. I, I did this myself. The older Python 2 version is still maintained. Um, RT Val, I see a question in the um, in the chat there. RT Val is not on GitHub. It's in it's on kernel.org. Um, I'll po I guess I'll I'll post somewhere the location later. Um, there's a lot of great tools that have been uh, being used recently for measuring real time type performance and other OS level things. One of them was uh, Stress NG. So I also recently added stress ng as sort of a load to um, RT val. It's not the way we normally run RT val, but if you want to um, sort of run any of the tests from stress ng and then have cyclic tests doing the measurement of how well those tests are doing, then you can use RT val to do that. Um, do you use this with customers on embedded systems? We don't use RT val for embedded systems. My company doesn't do much embedded, but I'm very aware that um, how important um, the RT test suite and cyclic test is to embedded people. So I'm very careful not to bloat it and make sure that it will still work well for embedded folks. Um, so what, what to do in the future here? Um, like I, I personally believe that cyclic test works well enough and um, you know, we've been told before we could rewrite it and stuff, but I've always needed to maintain this old version. We've never gotten around to it. It seems to work well enough, but there's a huge bunch of things that we need to do in cyclic test, in RTVAL and in other tools, probably people need to do uh, over and over. Um, so it'd be nice to sort of uh, extract this functionality and put it in libraries uh, for other people to use. Um, I fixed bugs in RTVAL um, for doing things like parsing CPUs uh, to see which CPUs are online. And I found like crazy things like three implementations in the code and plus two more that were ad hoc. And, um, and then, so, so it's just ridiculous. Um, okay, so this uh, cyclic text uh, options to output uh, JSON or XML, um, these things would all be nice. Um, <clears throat> Um, also, I mean, we're already doing stuff like this, but um, the code doesn't always work very well with containers and um, partitions um, because this kind of code assumes that it has the whole machine. Um, I mean, a very simple example that's probably pretty fixable is a lot of the code has to access the debug file system, which is usually hidden from a partition. Um, um, but just the idea that we might have um, a certain area of the machine, which we want to use for real-time applications and another area of the machine, which doesn't care about that. Um, these are the things that uh, the, the um, application, the measurement software could improve on. Um, just brainstorming some more wild ideas. Like I'd kind of like to, this is maybe vaporware until it's actually done, but I'd like to see some sort of workbench that could uh, um, for real-time programmers that, you know, would tie in uh, various uh, software, maybe in a nice GUI or web interface. Uh, um, yeah, and uh, like I said, um, I'm always open for patches and ideas and from the RT community. So I've, I've gone over time here. I haven't answered all the questions yet. I can answer questions in chat while uh, we move on to the next fella. Yeah, yeah, we can, we have always this chat there, and I think it's more more practical now to to answer the questions in the chat. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you. So now I pass the the word to Henrik with the using the brand RT and and the deterministic networking. So it's our time, Henrik. All right. So share the screen. All right. So talking about using Linux to do some fun stuff. Um, this all started uh, last year when I switched jobs and uh, discovered to my happy uh, happenstance that the room next door held a robotic arm. And as all other things, that was a solution looking for a problem. Um, oh, come on. Yeah. So I'm currently working at Syntef, um, where a research nonprofit foundation with a lot of people. I'm currently based in Trondheim uh, in the, the division of reliable automation. Um, my background is engineering cybernetics. I've been using Linux in real time for quite a while now, working with it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis since 2011. Um, did real-time audio in Cisco uh, for the telepresence uh, codex. Uh, currently, since August last year, I've been at Syntef in Trondheim uh, doing reliable automation, uh, where I mainly work on a satellite project, a year project, where we're going to make an on-orbit satellite servicer, basically one satellite grabbing hold of another one and do refueling and repairs on satellites in orbit to uh, do life extension. Wait, sorry. Uh, then I also do various industry projects uh, at Syntef, mostly small projects, where I just look at the real-time problems, look at traces, uh, figure out what is wrong or if it's good enough. Uh, and I also run a small TSN lab uh, in Trondheim, uh, which is also playing a role in this project. Um, before moving uh, on to the talk itself, uh, I thought it would be good to just have a short introduction to AVB and TSN. I'm not sure how familiar people are with this. Uh, so I added some slides. I'll just go through them quickly and you have them for reference for later. So AVB started as um, an audio uh, an audio protocol to extend audio video systems with microphones and speakers, mainly uh, pro audio. Uh, and that was later extended to time sensitive networking where they decided they could use, uh, use this for other things than just uh, AV. There are terms like bridges and stations, talkers and listeners, basically just names for the actors in the network. Uh, and TSN and AVB talks about streams, which is basically uh, a deterministic stream from one talker to one or many listeners. And through TSN, you get uh, guaranteed delivery and bounded latency on the network traffic. And this is important in real-time systems. Um, Steve talked a lot about that earlier. And this is no different in the networking world when it comes to TSM. Um, you talk about uh, stream reservation classes, uh, typically A and B, which where A is the highest priority. Uh, and it gives you a upper bound on latency through the network. And a class A stream will give you a two millisecond latency guarantee. Um, and all of this is coupled with uh, PTP to get accurate timestamps. So there's a separate profile for PDP in AVB called the generalized PDP. Um, and finally, uh, all these AV endpoints were considered to be really small systems, so a microphone or a speaker. You don't want to implement the entire IP stack. Uh, so for that reason, uh, AVB and TSN is on the layer two in the network, so ether frames, basically. So it's fairly low level. Um, and that's be because of the history from AVB. Uh, and yeah, and then moving on to TSN, because the moment you had deterministic networking for audio, uh, people started putting everything except audio through those streams. Um, so then they forked out TSN and added some more standards to get even better uh, time guarantees. And, and even though they want to put this into uh, robotics and industrial IoT and a lot of fancy words, uh, there's still no, um, official tag for uh, for control data in uh, TSN yet. But you can use the experimental format if you want to roll your own streams, as I've done later in this uh, talk. All right, so what, what I do at 
uh, at work is uh, I do satellite stuff and TSN, but there's other groups that do advanced robotics. Uh, and basically, if you can think of anything crazy you want to do with a robot, there are people working at it. Uh, and one of the problems uh, they are currently working on is to use uh, image uh, computer vision to detect uh, parts hanging on an inverting conveyor belt, so basically suspended underneath, and then grab those parts with a robotic arm. That's actually a really hard problem because you first have to detect the part you want to grab, and then you have to find exactly where your robotic arm is, where the end defector is, and then you need to find the pendulum motion of the part because they are suspended underneath, and calculate where the part will be by where the end effector is, and then create a path to that place in time in the future, and then move the arm to that place, and then grab hold of it and lift it off the belt. Uh, and this requires a significant amount of computational power. And most robotic controllers uh, attached to robotic arms are not strong enough or powerful enough to run these algorithms. And it's not easy to include cameras and LIDARs and pattern or 3D point clouds, stuff like that, to this as well. So it will be very useful if you could move the computational algorithms away from the robot itself. Um, so the arm uh, located in my office next door is a Universal Robotics UR10E, which is a 60 degrees of freedom arm and it can lift 10 kilograms. And for those Americans, that will be about pi half stones. So you know how heavy that is. Um, it's also what they call operator safe, meaning if it detects uh, a very sharp increase in power to move the arm, it will stop. So typically if it tries to bash through your head or through a wall, it won't do that. It has a fairly nice user interface. Um, it has a simulator, which is handy. Uh, and they also have a, a way to upload scripts from outside. So you can upload, you can write the script on a computer and it's really easy to upload it to the controller. And they also have this thing they call the real-time data exchange, uh, which is interesting. Um, and what that is, is basically a very simple protocol where you can define recipes for state information from the robot and uh, input to the robot that you can send in both directions. Uh, so you can define an output recipe for, uh, say, uh, joint angles or temperatures or speed and velocities for all the motors. Um, the downside is you can only have one output recipe. Input recipes, on the other hand, are um, a set of general registers you can write to. And for some reason, you can have multiple input recipes from multiple endpoints. So a lot of people can talk to the robot at the same time. Um, that being said, you cannot, you can only have, um, you cannot have overlapping recipes, meaning two remotes can't write to the same registers. Uh, and you need a script running on the robot to actually read those registers and use to something. You can't write uh, directly to the angular speed of the base joint, for instance. Uh, and all of this runs um, with two millisecond slots. So you have outgoing frames for robotic state every two milliseconds, uh, which gives you a four millisecond round trip if you want to write something back. Um, or if you're unlucky and you miss the two millisecond slot, you have like six milliseconds. Uh, and all of this runs the TCP protocol, uh, which is a bit problematic, but we have a way around that as well. Uh, yeah, so um, setting up a recipe is a, a really, really naive uh, set up. Basically, you just write in text um, the registers and values you want, and you get a reply with the size of those registers uh, and the recipe ID, and then the, the controller will start pumping data to you or expect you to send it data. Um, so it's um, fairly easy to set up. Um, so I've wrapped all of this in a library. I call it liburx. Um, that handles uploading scripts. Uh, it handles setting up the RTDE uh, streams. Um, and it cross compiles to ARM64 as well, because that's what we're using on the um, satellite project. Um, it's currently in Mozilla Public License 2, but I haven't been allowed to officially release it yet. Uh, we're waiting for some wrap up in the Eros project, but it will be 
um, handled soon. Um, and then everything is nice and tidy and we can make a nice profit. Uh, ah, that was the wrong way. Uh, yeah, so uh, as an example, this is the code you need to actually implement a PID controller for the robot using LibURX. Uh, so it's uh, fairly tight. Uh, you don't need that much code to connect to the robot. Okay, so here's here's the idea, the scenario we wanted to do for the uh, inverted pendulum approach. We wanted to take a control logic and path planner and connect it to the UR controller over the network. Um, and the problem with that is that you introduce a lot of latencies and uncertainties. So for instance, in the network, uh, you will have packet loss. Now TCP will give you um, lossless transmission, but it will do retransmit and that will result in latencies. Uh, you will also have queues on the switches that will introduce latencies or frame drops. Uh, and finally, on the control box, as Stephen noted earlier, you will have scheduling latencies, you will have interrupt interference, uh, you will have to traverse the networking stack, and you will also have issues with the PCIe backplane. Uh, so our setup currently, is basically two Intel boxes um, with some RAM with a M2 disk uh, and dual i210. The Intel i210 card supports TSN and it has good support for that in the kernel. It's been there for three, four years now, I think. And the network, we have a couple of catalysts and two small motor switches. And we have the universal robotics arm and also the simulator, which is useful when you develop the protocols. So to combat the issue with latency through the network, um, uh, we added a proxy mode to LibURX. Basically, we just take the RTDE stream and we wrap that in a TSN stream. Uh, and we do that um, just to make sure that the traffic through the network does not interfere and causes TCP to retransmits. And TSN should provide guarantees enough for you not to worry about losing frames. Um, on the endpoints, uh, on the controller and on the machine we attach to UR10, uh, we run preempt RT to try to reduce the latencies and uh, deter as much as possible. And since this also runs uh, with a very, very tight two millisecond period, we use the deadline scheduler uh, that has proven quite uh, proven to be that has worked quite nice. Uh, and of course, we put that in a yet another library, um, which we call libtsm, um, which is just a tiny layer on top of libavtp, which is Avenue's uh, transport layer uh, library for avtp streams. Uh, so that will be dropped alongside with liburx once uh, Eros is finalized. And you have to configure um, the network card as well. Uh, you have support for this in the kernel. Uh, you would just have to tell MQPrio what priorities you want to use for which hardware queue. Uh, there's a link in the reference at the end to some documents describing how to do that. Uh, so now we have a slightly different setup. Um, so basically we connect directly to the robot with one box to avoid uh, interference and packet loss. Uh, and then we set up a TSN stream between one box and the controller and pipe that through the network with some catalysts that also supports TSN. So you have path reservation and queuing reservations and everything to avoid <clears throat> losing, sorry, losing frames along the way. So yeah, you minimize network jitter by having a direct link, uh, use preempt RT and skip deadline. Um, to avoid uh, latencies through the networking stack and scheduling issues. Approve that with the uh, sketch deadline even further. Uh, and then you define that as a TSN stream to traverse the network uh, fast as well. So summary, I've been talking fast, I see. Um, yeah, preempt RT and TSN so, uh, worked really well for this. Uh, it allows us to uh, 
to move the computation away from the from the raw body, uh, either because the controller is not powerful enough or because it's in a hostile environment, which is also um, important in robotics. Uh, another nice side effect of this is when you have PTP sync time between the machines, uh, you get really accurate uh, logs. So you can actually uh, detect small variations a lot easier because you know the time on one machine is the same as the one on the other machine. And that's uh, really useful. Um, um, UR has a simulator that runs been delivered in a VM, which is really nice. You can mess around with it at home without actually breaking the wall in the office. Um, and also debug the networking interface. Um, since it's a VM, it's not exactly real time. So it runs at approximately 388 hertz on my machine compared to the 500 hertz. Um, some system tuning is required, of course. Um, and then configuring the catalysts, that's an interesting experience. Uh, even though I worked in Cisco for seven and a half years, uh, I never got around to actually uh, learning to do catalyst config. Uh, and now that I have a catalyst and no one in Cisco to help me configure them, I realize that's actually not that easy. Um, and of course, why settle for a multi core deadline system with indirect priority inversions, uh, SMIs, and all the fun when you can throw some network on it as well? So, yeah, why not? Yeah, and remaining steps, uh, as I said in the beginning, um, IEEE 1722 is the IEEE standard that defines the AVTP stream format, which is basically the protocol. Um, for the TSN streams. And it has no format for control data. Uh, so I just grabbed uh, experimental format for now, uh, but this is something that needs to be fixed. Uh, and also the, the, the library doesn't really do signaling that much. So you have to configure both parts um, before you can get this to work. So it's not, not that user-friendly at the moment. Um, and I also need to really run my tests with uh, some uh, some heavy crosslink traffic and uh, look at the results. Uh, and also, you need to be careful with bash history because the universal, the, the robotic arm, you can just send it a script. Basically, you can just use netcat to send it a new script. So um, this script here will just put the arm in a straight up, uh, upright position and you can send it wherever you want. And if you set the A value, the acceleration to a, to a high value, the arm moves really fast, which I discovered because it nearly knocked me senseless at the lab one night. Uh, and one final thing, um, the GPDP um, profile uh, promises you one microsecond accuracy. Um, but if you actually try to get the time from the I-210 on the test system, it actually takes 19 to 38 microseconds. A fairly distinct bounce, but uh, there are some issues with you are not being prioritized through the um, PCIe Express backplane. So that's um, something uh, I should look more into, but that's an interesting, I think I have a plot of that as well. Uh, yeah, so the top, top row is just reading clock monotonic. Um, this is a really simple test, no tuning, nothing. So there's probably interrupts happening in the high spikes. The top line is clock monotonic and it averages on about 2,200 cycles on the CPU. Uh, and the bottom one is reading the PTP time from the networking card. Um, so it's basically 19 microseconds and the standard deviation is about 2.4 microseconds, I think. You see, there's two two bands, so there's basically something stopping the, the traffic on the on the bus. But yeah, and I think that yeah, the rest is resources. That there will be. I'll drop the slides later on. So that was my talk. A bit ahead of schedule, even. Well, that's that's really good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if people have questions. For Henrik, uh, uh, if you want to put them in the uh, chat, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll just get the chat. Um, oh, hang on. Oh, that was a lot. So, uh,
Yeah, uh, so uh, to elaborate on Steven's uh, comment, uh, I actually almost uh, knocked myself senseless. The arm moved really fast and I looked up and suddenly it was an arm like this close to my head. So it was like, whoo, <laughs> that moved fast. Uh, worst latency you can tolerate on a full cycle. Uh, so I actually don't know. Uh, the UR controller is fairly, it is really helpful. Uh, so basically, I when I do the control, I just set the angular velocity of each joint until I have the desired end position. Uh, and all those uh, velocities will be translated into, I think they do an int internal PID regulator on the torque on each joint. Um, so they will make sure that I don't do anything stupid. And they're also a wind down in the UR script views as well. So if we don't send an update to the speed, it will just gradually decrease the speed. So if suddenly the, the link goes down, the robot will just gradually stop. It won't re reach the destination, but it won't rip itself apart either. Um, so, um, I I don't know is the answer really. Um, so what you want to make sure is that you don't have too much variance in the latency. That is far more dangerous, I think, than having a 10 millisecond constant latency uh, versus a two millisecond constant latency. If you have somewhere between two and 10, doing a PID regulator for that is going to be really, really difficult because it will have unlinearities and all sorts of crazy things. Uh, are there any more questions for me? Um, did I miss some questions? Uh, give me a shout out. I think I answered. Yeah, I can them, thanks again. Uh, it's fascinating to hear that. So thank you for pulling that together for us. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Shaded. Uh, and if people want to keep asking questions in the chat, I think maybe what we'll do now is maybe turn it over to a Q&A with uh, Thomas. Um, and so, Thomas. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you. Uh, Thomas, if you want to unmute. And, oops, Thomas is asking questions. <laughs> he wants to, <laughs> he's got one more for you. <laughs> Why don't you just unmute Thomas and ask and we can talk, turn into discussion and others can ask questions too. I have already unmuted. Ah, now we hear you. Do you want to just uh, ask Henrik your question that you just typed in the chat? Oh yeah, it is. Uh, Henrik, did you did you uh, look at that uh, IEEE standard 6802, which is TSN for industrial applications? Um, not in detail. Um, there are so many standards, and IEEE are so fond of writing long texts. Um, <laughs> so, so no, I haven't. Uh, but it's on my on my to do list. Yeah, that one that one at least goes into the right direction for robotics and stuff like that. Oh, okay, excellent. Thanks. So. Okay, so Thomas, do you want to just sort of do you have any comments to start off start us off with today before the question we get the questions getting typed in? I don't have comments now. Okay, well then I've got a question or two lined up <laughs> while, we're <waiting> for others. <laughs> while we're waiting for others to sort of go. Um, so for people who are just starting out right now, where do you see the best source of information? Um, so for people who are trying to work on um, making writing drivers to be effective when configured to run with real time, where do you recommend people start to go these days? <sighs> That's a really good question. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay. So I mean, the, the, let me let me uh, let me ask a, a question. What kind of drivers do they want to write? Just a regular device driver, which is or a driver which is specific to a real-time application usage. I'd say, um, why don't you answer for both? Because we're going to have both cases out there. <laughs> So a regular device drivers just write them so they 
or fitting into the kernel and do the right thing on their subsystem and they're good. Mm -hmm. they, if, you, if you do the right, the right stuff with just what everybody else does and what the maintainers tell you to do, then you're probably good. So there's not much you can screw up. So, so the, the, the typical things or, um, oh, let me disable interrupt here just because, or let me disable preemption just because. I mean, that's usually not necessary in drivers. And uh, if people use proper locking, then all of that is very well hidden behind. So it's not an issue. If you want to do really device drives for real time usage, you should better know what you're doing. Yeah, but how did they learn? <laughs> Uh, by doing it. <laughs> oh, right. No, like that, that I'm trying to work on then as a part of a community, right? In terms of, sorry, it sounds like that's a gap that we should start to figure out how to fill this next year. Um, uh, I mean, yes, uh, documentation is always a problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what sort? Oh, we sort of talked this with jo about John already, but I'm just wondering: uh, Do you have any other additional recommendations about test infrastructure, um, or that people should be doing and testing regimes that they should follow when they're wanting to check their code is working properly before they submit it upstream? There's a long list in documentation what you should do with your code uh, before submitting it upstream. Unfortunately, most people ignore that. Okay, but what about for the real-time specific aspects to make sure that it, it won't cause issues? Uh, Would you like to have seen run, things like that? Um, so right now, for, for, most, for most people who, who develop just drivers or some random feature in the kernel, real-time testing is, is hard to do because you have to apply extra patches. You have to know what you're doing. But once the stuff is upstream it's just going to happen for them so that the the, the 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 continuous integration systems will whack them over the head over time okay and i mean it, this depends because um if it's something which is a esoteric hardware driver which is not available on everybody board, yes, then it's going to be tough to, to be covered by, by continuous integration until, unless you run your own, which you might do. Okay. Um, no, I, I, actually, once, once, once RT is, is, is away, uh, better available in, in the main line, uh, I want to, to try to extend the testing recommendations to, hey, you should at least run once th with an RT enabled kernel on that thing and uh, see what explodes. Yep, so that uh, we keep it all running. Um, are there, um, so one of the questions I've got is, you know, how can the wider community get involved in helping to fill the remaining gaps? Where are you looking for help? Documentation, documentation. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's one of the really important things. Okay. Um, and the other, it's the other stuff. Uh, working on the remaining, on the remaining gaps. I mean, it's it, it's it's getting really hard now because we're we just. I mean, looking at the. This easy feature migrate disable. Oh uh, yeah, we had it in in RT for I don't know how long. Uh, everybody hated it. Everybody knew it was coming, and so it got ignored for a very long time. Now now we have it. So so now now Linus wants to to use it for something else, um, uh, which which we need also for for RT to have. Uh, some of the KMAP atomic of the high mem support working on RT, which I don't care about, but other people care about. Um, and so, so it, it starts to get really into into the the thing. Either you 
you know where to to help or you if you if you have to start catch up games dear we are probably way ahead before you even figure out what to do it's a, it's a little bit tricky now okay so the easy parts are gone <laughs> Okay, so it's documentation. So, print K. I mean, help John, help John getting print K done. Oh yeah, that's going to be interesting. <laughs> I mean, it took only uh, one and a half year to get the ring buffer smirched. Right. So. Uh, well, in Turkey, using the word merge here obviously asks, okay, <laughs> what's the status? And, help, and it sounds like there's not too much people can do to help at this point in time, other than potentially do some reviews and things like that. Right, review testing. So, so what we're we're currently doing, basically, some of our engineers are working on various uh, bits and pieces, and then we throw it over to to uh, Sebastian, uh, who is trying to integrate it into our TC what exp explodes, expose it to the people in form of an RT release. Uh, and then uh, we, we, we shuffle gradually the stuff over uh, to, to people uh, in various areas, scheduler locking and other things in that uh, range. Unfortunately, there's a contention problem because uh, it ends up at the very same people uh, having to review and deal with that. So, so reviewing stuff, yes, it's always helpful. Testing stuff, telling us where it explodes, where we have to fix things, where we, where, where we took the wrong turn. Yes, that's, that's truly helpful. Um, and I think Daniel's got a question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, so, I'm not seeing one. There? It's okay. He, okay. He's got it. He's, 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 un, he's unmuted. <laughs> yeah. Daniel. So there's this increasing demand of running Linux on safe critical systems. And uh, certainly the print RT is a, a building block for it. So I would like to know what are your thoughts about using Linux on safety critical system and how do you think that uh, we can make progress in this regard using the print RT? I mean, it, it, uh, using Linux and safety critical system has been done 20 years ago. It's just a matter of how you design your safety critical system, what kind of system uh, design decisions you take. If you have diverse systems with a simple voter, you can do it because then you turn the, the, the operating system more or less into a black box and you don't have to care or worry about it. Um, so, but of course people are trying to create silver bullets with uh, preempt or T and uh, auditing itself and uh, trying to avoid all the extra hardware. Let's see where that goes. I mean, a lot of that stuff is wishful thinking right at the moment. I mean, there's some, some interesting outcome of that as well, because those people are actually looking not very, very carefully at all the uh, compiler warnings, which are suppressed by, by our warning levels. So, so they use more, more tools on it. Uh, which is a good thing. Um, and uh, so they they have ideas and, and, and also common interests with other people. So if you look at the security folks, they want to have unmapped uh, data for their applications in order to, so that nothing else can actually look at their secret source. And uh, that's something the, the safety people want as well, because that helps them uh, to argue, to argue better towards freedom of interference. So there's a lot of, of things which, which are helpful what they are doing, whether that's 
at the end going to be something where you have Linux certified at a certain uh, safety integrity level or not, that's still an interesting question. It, and it's at the very end, even if you could find a way to, to argue it, uh, then it's you still have to find hardware which actually uh, fulfills the requirements uh, what the software uh, depends on. Okay, so, so uh, voting and as as Henrik said on the chat, and voting systems can get you a long way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you need libraries, and you need especially you need hardware which is reliable. <laughs> Um, for the other um, presenters, feel free to turn on your camera and ask questions right now, or if there's other questions in the chat. Um, you know, let's turn this into a discussion for the last few minutes we've got, if you'd like. Sure. Okay. Um, so, let's see. Um, we've got a question in from Ahmed. Um, saying, isn't freedom of interference a harder problem to solve than a, with monolithic kernels? Of course, it is. Yeah. Okay. I mean, freedom of interference is not the, proving freedom freedom of interference is the really hard problem, mm -hmm. and that's that's one of the reasons why they want to do. Uh, for example, unmapping of data in the kernel space, so so that the kernel doesn't have a direct map. Uh, for for the data sections of the application, because then uh, they can they can argue that no accidental uh, whatever uh, stray pointer in the kernel is ever going to write over their uh, uh, user space data. It's still hard to argue, but it's it's it makes it easier. So there's a lot of stuff which you, which is really hard to to, to argue in a in a kernel as complex as the Linux kernel is. So that's why most really certifiable uh, um, system, uh, uh, operating systems are very, very tiny. Okay, uh, does anyone else here have some questions? I'm just wondering, uh, for instance, for John, um, how are you keeping in sync with the test suites with what Thomas is you know, what's emerging upstream and catching up upstream. How's that happening? Um, I, I think that um, the, the main workforce there, the cyclic test is, is actually pretty stable and people haven't been uh, requesting any changes in it to uh, keep up with any features. Like keeping up with a new kernel is actually done through different tests. So. Not seeing, any change, not seeing too much change is needed, is what you're saying. Right. No, um, because, I mean, it, yeah, I know. cyclic test relies on the, on the user space interface, and the user space ABI is not changing. So right. it, 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 would, it just detects when we screwed up with the latencies, nothing else. So. And it pretty much covers what, we, covers what we need for a very long time. Okay. Um, I guess, Steve, um, once everything is sort of upstream and we've got our stable backports, does this mean each of these stable kernels is pretty much going to, you know, just go and then eventually this task will, you know, go away? Poof. Uh, if we wish, no. Um, <laughs> no, what we tend to do is obviously everything that's long-term stable is going to still be long-term stable and, and doesn't have RT yet. So we're going to be doing that until then. But eventually when the oldest long-term stable happens to be real time, uh, what we plan on still doing is we have to be involved because we have to make sure things still back are backported that are real time bugs, and you know we can't just expect the uh, the stable teams that are working right now to understand the real time requirements. So there might be you know things that are fine, but we still have to monitor and say, hey, this this caused a latency or this caused uh, unbounded latency or unbounded prior version it's been fixed that needs to be backported and just slapping stable on it might not be good enough we have to make sure confirm it so we still plan on having the stable team monitoring to make sure that the long-term stables and such still 
um, pass the tests that we run, like RT eval and everything. So that still needs to work. So that's Excellent. Well, if we don't have any more questions um, from the panelists, we're just about at the end of our time. So. Um, so is this the year of real time Linux be or next year? <laughs> Not, don't want to do it on 2020. It has to be next year. <laughs> it's safer. It's yeah. Give it. Yeah. <laughs> It, this has definitely been a year. Um, <laughs> well, again, thank you every mu very much, everyone. And thank you, Thomas. Um, and with that, I think we will stop recording and wish you all a good weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was fun. Yeah. Thank you. Guys. Same to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.